Yeah. So here we are, the church, the church, in church, the church, in church, right? Most often scattered, but right now gathered, right? The church, the bride, the body, right? The mess, mysterious, misunderstood often, flawed in so many ways, yet the Lord sees it as flawless. Often hated, often treasured, always controversial, yet somehow we end up being peacemakers. We're dirty and spotless at the same time, and we're a bunch of do-gooders that are full of scandal. Ah, the church. What better thing to give your life to, right? You know, that's funny. Some people, um, they, and we fight about this in Christianity, about what the church is, you know, is it, is, is it a people, uh, you know, is it a group of people or is some people, you know, it's a place. How many people went to church tonight, right? Raise your hand if you went to church tonight, right? Yeah, we went to church. But yet at the same time, right? We're the church, but we went to church, and, and we fight about that. And uh, I would just say that if you spend any time in the scriptures, there's just never one without the other. It's just, it's both. It's, it's God's people, but they're always gathering in places, you know? And, and, and the scriptures talk about it. They, they planted churches, and they met, people met in temples, and they met in public squares, and they met on the side of a hill, and they met by a lake, and they met in people's homes, but they always met. They always met in places. God has places that he sets up for people to meet. And the church is a very, very special thing. I'll just call it a thing. Is that cool? It's a special thing. Carl, is it your birthday today, isn't it? That's close enough. Hey, happy birthday. All right. All right that's awesome. All right, so um, it's Jesus time, right? Carl gets it. The church is a really special thing. You know, the, the Word of God actually speaks highly of the church. And uh, God says this in 1 Tim Timothy 3.15. He says, this is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of truth. Just think about that. Us, right here. That God, God's, God's true. He's right about everything, right? And he's given us his truth and his word. And, and we, the people, we're the pillar and foundation. We're the ones who are supposed to be carrying this thing and supporting this thing and, and bringing it to the world. He's going to use us for that. That's amazing, right? The Bible also says in Ephesians 3.10, it says God's purpose was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You think about this for a second. You know that the Bible says in Proverbs 3.19 that it was by wisdom that God founded the earth. It was by wisdom that God founded the earth. So when you look at the natural order of things, you look at nature and you see how amazing God is and the intricacies and the details of what he's made. And all of us do that. We look at sunsets and birds chirping and the ocean and, and we look at our babies and we see all this amazing, amazing, what is it? Wisdom. Only God could do this. Like, amazing, right? And God says that his most amazing display will be through his church. Even more than the bird on the wire. Even more than the mountaintop. It's us. That he wants to display his wisdom through you. That's what God says about the church. Why are we talking about that? Well, we got done with our move series. Did you guys benefit from that? I was moving, right? I was moving. Uh, we moved from rhetoric to reality. We changed the way we look at things, right? We got to live by the truth of God's word. But we're done with that, and so we're jumping back into Luke. And the reason why we've been in Luke for over a year is because we want to understand what truth is. We need to know what truth is. If we're going to worship correctly, we need to have it based on truth. Not what your grandma told you, but what God says about himself in the word of God. And so to, to worship him in spirit and in truth, we've been seeking truth in the gospel of Luke. We've been going through it section by section for well over a year. Don't know when it's going to end, but we're going to bring out all that we can from it, okay? 
And, and, and God wants us to worship in spirit and truth. And so we've been studying through Luke so we could find out what Jesus actually says, what he actually taught, what he actually did, who he is, what he claimed. I want to know that. That's how I want to base my worship, on the truth, yes. right? That's what we want. And so that's what we've been doing. So I want to invite you uh, to open your Bible, please. Don't be a slacker. Open up your Bible. Luke chapter 19 is where we're going we're gonna to glean from tonight. And, and God is going to talk about what I just started talking about, the church. He's going to talk about his church. He does a lot in the Bible. But in this case, he's going to talk about the church. And so if we're going to worship him correctly, right, and we're going to be the church and go to church, then we need to have a proper perspective on what that really is. Or else we can't worship him correctly, right? Okay. So, so we're going to study Luke 19, 45 through 48. You guys ready to read it? All right. God, have your attention? All right. Luke 19, verse 45. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple. But the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they could, they could think of nothing because all the people hung on every word he said. Okay, so, so, so why the church? Like, the church, and I walk lightly here because I know people are passionate about two different sides of this about what the church is. Is it a people? Is it a place? Is it both? I, okay, I'm just, but I just want to talk about why the people in a place. And when he makes a place, what's its purpose? Does that make any sense? So we want to talk about that. See, this building that has been provided has a purpose. Like he didn't, like 40 people with no money don't rent 10,000 square feet on 441. Right? It, it just, it doesn't make, that's kind of stupid really if you think about it. It doesn't make any sense. They have no money and no clue, but, but you just do it because, because God wants to get something done. And so he, he provided, and if you know, you guys know the story, he provided in, in supernatural, crazy ways for this place to even be, for you to even sit in this room tonight. It's an amazing provision. The paint, the drywall, the seating, everything that you, this is what free looks like. It's not the fanciest church, but it's a good one, right? It's a good one, and God wants to use it for something, and that's what we want to talk about. Tonight. You know why we gather? I'm going to give you some real details on why we gather and what we're doing here and what God wants to do with us, but let me tell you the reason why we gather, like in a nutshell. The reason we gather is, is, is because uh, there's something on 441. I want you to see this. There's something on 441 that I saw the other day. You guys may have seen it. And this is the reason why God has a church right here. Can you put that picture up? Read that. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to be sick. Right? I want to be sick. I want to be, listen, that's sickening. I'm not telling you to switch to, to, to Bright House or nothing. I'm not saying that. I, I don't even know that the, that the CEOs are, are cognizant of what in the world they're even doing. But, but this is what we're living in. This is the culture that we live in, where you are the center of the universe. And they're re I love the wording, too, isn't it? You couldn't have asked for anything better. We are reinforcing this thing. We want to shove this down your throat and create a world where you are the center of everything. You're God. That's what it says, doesn't it? Everything revolves around you. And that's why we're here. Because we need to have a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. We need to have a different way of thinking here. We need to create a different thing in here so we can bring it out there and fight that crap that's up on the billboard. That's why we're here, right? And that's why God made this place. Well, what did he say about it here? He said his temple would be a, a house of prayer. It's a, 
It's a house of worship, right? It's like, that's what we call it, like legally and stuff. We're a, we're a house of worship, right? That's a church. But what does that all really mean? See, we, we just throw words around, but what does it really mean? And I'm not talking about the trivial things, the, the little things about like what color the paint is or what time we start or uh, how many songs we do or, you know, all that silly stuff that means nothing. I'm talking about the main things, like why does the local expression even exist? You know, what, what, what's, it, what's its purpose? What, what's this all about? Why are we here on Saturday night gathering here? Like what's the reason for this? And I think that this text speaks clearly to that. I want to do something different, though. I want, to, I want to use this to let Jesus teach us what it's not, okay? And it's clear. You'll see it right here. I'm not making anything up. So here's, I, I think I have five things I want to share with you. And I, I jot, jot these things down so you're ready for Thursday night small group. Amen? Amen. Okay. Uh, the first thing that it is not is a religious place. The church is not a religious place. I, I love when people say, well, I'm just not religious. Well, I'm not either. Heaven forbid I'm religious, right? I don't want to be religious. And this place should not be a religious place. I'm talking about repetitive rituals with the intent to get closer to God, to make God love you more, to, to, to help make him happy because he's disgruntled dad. And if we make, you know, like doing things over and over again and you did it all the time, why? I don't know. Anyone grow up in a church like that? Many of you have. You grew up in a church where people were doing stuff week in and week out over and over again. You had no idea what they were doing or why, but you did it just because. Because great grandma did it and grandma did it and mom did it and you better do it. Yeah. What's all this mean? I don't know. They're speaking in Latin, but you better do it. And a lot of us have come from that and that's not what the church is supposed to be. That's not why we gather. You know, it mentions here, the reason why I'm talking about um, religion is it mentions the sacrifices here. It talks about um, selling animals for sacrifice. You see it there in verse 45? Well, the, the, the sacrificial system was actually a good thing. It was actually a, a system that God had given people and it was, so it was a God-given thing, and it was good, and it was for the purpose of getting man back into proper position with God. Like, if you sinned, you did this, it put you back right. Do you guys understand this, right? They would bring animal after animal, and they'd get back in proper position with God. And, and, and that's good. And so they did it. But here's the thing. Before Jesus came, about 800 years before Jesus, there was this prophet that God spoke through. His name was Isaiah. And he spoke to the people. He said, listen, that sacrificial system that I give you, that's going to go away because there's going to come a time that you're not going to have to do that anymore, that there's going to be a Messiah and he's going to take away all of your sins so you don't have to keep doing this anymore. This is what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read some verses to you. Just listen. Isaiah 53. He says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins." See, there was, a, there was a day that was forecast, predicted, that, that you wouldn't have to have the sacrificial system anymore. And so here is Jesus in the temple saying, I'm about to usher in this thing that you guys have been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years. Here I am. Everything's going to change right now where you no longer have to bring your sacrifice to God. God's going to bring your sacrifice to you. You get that? He's bringing the sacrifice to you. He's satisfying your sin problem in Jesus. The difference between religion and faith is that religion is what we're trying to do to somehow make God happy, get close to God. And faith is trusting that God already did all that. And you don't have to do that stuff anymore for him to get close to you. He got super, super close to you in Jesus Christ on the cross and resurrected. 
That's the sacrifice. And so he's like, you don't have to do this anymore. So the church, when we gather here, this is not a religious place. I'm just doing a bunch of stuff over and over again, hoping for something to happen. That's not what this is. The second thing is, is it's not a marketplace. It's not a marketplace. You see there also, it says that they're selling the animals for sacrifices, right? You see it there in the text. They were, this is sick. They were profiting off of people's sin, right? That's sick, right? Bad. Uh, it's not a place to promote personal gain. It, listen, if you have an agenda here, just leave now. If you have a personal agenda to leverage this place for your personal gain, the doors are that way, okay? That's not what this place is. And when I say it's not a marketplace, not only is it not for personal gain, but it's not to be run like a business. It's not to a place where creative marketing plans fill the seats, right? No, it says that this house will be a house of prayer, right? It, that, that means that we don't need to market things creatively to fill the seats. No, we ask God to fill the seats. We're obedient to the Lord, and he fills the seats. Every day, he brings to the fellowship those being saved. None of we do. We don't, he might use our net being cast out, but it's him who does it. We don't have to be super, super creative that way. We don't. This thing about seeker-sensitive... Okay, first of all, the Bible says that no one is seeking God. So you're a moron if you open up a seeker-sensitive church because no one's looking for your church. So get over that stupidity and let's start doing something a little bit more biblical. We're not seeker-sensitive. We're not trying to market the church in a way that people will, will come purely because we blend into popular culture and we provide them a good product. Throw up. Garbage, right? Awful, right? It, it, it's a supernatural place. It's a supernatural place owned and operated by a supernatural God who promised that he was going to build his church. It's going to happen. And it's happening all over the world. The church is exploding worldwide. I mean, people that hated Jesus, like Rome, right? Rome hated Jesus. It became the official religion of the, of the Roman Empire. You can't stop Jesus. People, Muslims are coming to Christ. He's coming, he's appearing to them in dreams and visions. I mean, like, everyone's coming to Jesus. It's crazy. He's going to build his church. It's not a marketplace. It's a supernatural place. And this house of worship is not intended for personal use or to be run like a business. Okay, that's not what this is. So here's the third thing. I'm just going to go through them quickly. The third thing is that it's not a playhouse. Now, I'm not talking about like a Barbie playhouse. We can have a Barbie playhouse in the children's nursery. That'd be great. What I mean by that is, um, well, let's just put it this way. You know, God, there's a lot of things that God does not like. There's a lot of things that God doesn't like. Can you name a few? What does he like? What does he, do what does he dislike? Hypocrisy. Huh? Hypocrisy. What's that? Lying, lying cheating. What? Someone, someone, sin, yeah, sin, adultery, hates divorce, all that stuff, right? You know, like, there's a lot of things he doesn't like, but there's one thing that he loathes, and you hit it right on the head. He hates the facade. He hates the veneer, this fake, phony, I'm spiritual, but you're dead inside. This, this acting out of religious. It, it, he, he didn't like it. He preached against it harshly. Do me a favor and look in Matthew chapter 23. Ma Matthew chapter 23. Go there. Matthew 23 verse 27. Look at what it says here. What sor this is Jesus talking. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs Beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look right, like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know what I love about this? <clears throat> I love that, that Jesus uses whitewashed, too. Now, he, he could have said, you know, like, like, if you go to the graveyard, you might, you might decorate someone's grave real nice. I mean, you can, right? You can, you can decorate it real nice. 
But, but he uses whitewashed, right? Why does he use whitewashed? Well, the reason is, if you know anything about whitewashing, if, you, if you've been around long enough to know what, a white, what whitewashing is like on a fence, you'd paint it. It was almost, it was almost like skim milk, right? It's like skim milk. It, had a, it was mostly water with a little paint in it, and it would make it white, but it never lasted. And Jesus is quite clear here. You're like whitewashed tomb. You're, yeah, you're going to get outed. Trust me, you ain't fooling anybody with your little charade of religious activities. You, people are going to see through your little puff and cloud of, of fake shell game crap that you're trying to pull, quoting verses at everybody. They're going to see your life. It's going to come out in the end, trust me. And he hates this. He hates that. And so it, when I say a playhouse, that means like Broadway playhouse. He doesn't want us faking it, putting on a mask. He's looking for something real, you know? It says he, he drove out those selling animals for sacrifice. You know, fake, 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 fake. The reason why it's fake is because when you brought a sacrifice, it was supposed to be your animal. You know, something that, that, you, that you nurtured and grew and fed and took care of it. And then, like, it had some meaning to you. It had some value to you. And you'd have to take that thing and you'd have to give it to God as a sacrifice. And when it was yours, it hurt. Didn't David say, I will not bring my, my king a sacrifice that doesn't cost me something. The, the giving should hurt a little bit because it was yours. And what they're doing here is they're offering up fake crap. They're, they're just saying, you know what, you don't, have to, you don't have to spend the years, or the seasons, nurturing this animal and feeding it and watering it and taking care of it and then bring it. No, just go pick one up. It's like the, the rich uh, executive who, who sends his or her secretary to the store because it's his anniversary. He says, hey, go get something for my wife. That's crap. Right? There's nothing in that. It's an empty, fake gift. And that's what these people were doing. They were bringing unauthentic offerings to the Lord. And see, when Jesus says, my, house, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into, and then he says, a den of thieves, right? Do you know that he could have said, he could have stopped right there when he says, you've turned it into, stop. And if you put anything in there, anything other than a place where Jesus can connect with his flock in a real, authentic way, anything other than that is wrong. This is what the church, this is why he built this place. This is why he provided, so that you could connect with him. That's the reason we have church buildings. That's the main reason why the church has places that they meet, is to connect with their creator. The soul needs that more than anything else. But as you can see here, people were just throwing money at this relationship. They didn't, they didn't take care of this animal and bring it up and nurture it. and you know, They just slacked all year. And they'd go up and they'd go, hey, how much for that chicken? Oh, five bucks? All right, no problem. Here, give me that thing. Cut it, put it on the altar. Like, what is that? That's junk, right? They're throwing money at this thing. And don't we do that now? Like, I'm not calling out any names, but I've been doing this now for a long time, and I've been in, in the front of the room when the offering came. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of times. And it's like automatic all the time. People just, it's time to receive the offering, and so you see them. They pull out their money, and they, they start looking at it. And they think, how much do I got here? I got this. How much do I need for... Okay, so how much can I afford to give God? And they'll peel off a few and they'll dump it in the... Right? Garbage. Absolute garbage. Right? That's not what he wants. Right? That's not what he wants. That's why we pray here. It's in prayer that God connects with you. And he starts working on your heart. It's the offering, that's what the offering is all about here in this church. It's not about how much. It's about your attitude toward the how much. It's about your, your, your obedience to the how much that he tells you. Remember when I said, whatever he tells you, I love you. Be obedient to that thing. That's what he's looking for. If God loves a cheerful giver, then it's the willingness to the how much that the Holy Spirit's after, right? Right? Not the how much. It's, 
It's in your heart. He wants you. We're, not, we're talking more than just how much. We're talking about lordship here. We're talking about submission and a joyful surrender of your heart. That's what Jesus is after in the offering. And that's what he was after in the temple, but they weren't giving it to him. They were going up and buying a chicken and slicing its throat and, spl- and splashing his blood. That's nothing. He wants the real thing. He wants heart change in people. And that's why we meet here. That's why we meet. Here's the fourth thing. Um, It's not a castle. Now certainly we're a city on a hill, if you will. Think about castle. I always say this. I think of Disney castles, you know. They're up on the hill. Everyone in town's looking up. That's the awesome place. We all dream like Aladdin. We look, someday we're going to live up there. It's going to be a whole new world, right? We, that's, the way we view, that's not what I'm talking about. When I say the church is not a castle, I'm talking about um, for a select few, for the royal ones, for the noblemen, the upper class. This is not a place for people to be praised and it's only for certain people to be praised and elevated above everyone else and that's what a lot of people think about the church. Did you know that some people don't think that everyone should have access to their God? You know this. Did you know that the Jews didn't think that the Gentiles deserved their God. Remember Jonah? He hated the Gentile people so much that he was like mad at God. No, you can't be their God too. You're our God. I'm trying to hold on to him. Listen, dude, if he's really God, doesn't he deserve all of them? Like, you knucklehead. Right? Churches, I'm not going to say who they are or denomination or anything like that, but they have a, they have a priesthood. And the priesthood for, for, for centuries had a monopoly on God's word. It wasn't available to you and me. We, we would withhold that thing from them. And then fortunately in the four, mid-1400s, the, uh, the Gutenberg Bible was produced. And it, it wasn't produced in mass numbers, you know, like they would make a book now. Like, they, you know, they press it, put it in a, in, a, in a machine and press a button and, you know, thousands and thousands come out. It wasn't like that. But that started to 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 infiltrate into people's hands, into culture. And then uh, in the mid-1500s, I believe it's 1526, um, there's a guy named William Tyndale. I think we have his picture. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him. Uh, William Tyndale, uh, he realized that God's word's for everybody, that God would want everybody to have it. And so they started to translate ancient Hebrew and Greek text into the English language and mass produce it so that we could have that word of God even now. The church practice of the priesthood, confessing sin to a man, looking for forgiveness, needing some other special man as a go-between that has no place in the church of Jesus Christ. No place. First Peter 2.9, as a matter of fact, says, for you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, Speaking to all of us, right? You guys, you're a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. No longer is the priesthood needed. Ephesians 3.12 says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We don't need some priest to lead the way. We don't need some priest to intercede for us. There's only one in between, between the unseen one and us. It's the man, Christ Jesus. We don't need priests, right? There's no room in the church for a castle reserved for the nobleman. Here's number five. You ready for it? All right. It's not a parachurch. The church of Jesus Christ is not a parachurch. A parachurch, there's many of them across the world. These are Christian faith, I, I can't even, I, it's hard for me to even say it, but they're faith-based organizations. It's kind of a broad expression there, isn't it? Faith-based groups that, this is by definition, that work outside of the church or alongside of the church 
to engage in social issues, hunger and abortion and sex tra trafficking, and some would specialize in Bible translating and evangelism, and these are all good things. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. They're all very good things. Um, well, first of all, there's no such thing as working outside of the church. Do you know that Jesus Christ loves the church? Do you know that Jesus Christ laid his life down for the church? There's no working of Christ outside of his church, okay? It's in the church. You're in the family, right? You're not working outside of it or alongside of it. You're either in or you're out. And the church is in. We're the body of Christ. We're the, we're the visible God in this world right now. We make the invisible God visible right here. We're his body. There's no working outside of the church. There's no working alongside of the church. We're, we are the church. All these things that they do are good, but they're just doing. See, they're called to do. And, and I'm, if you know me, I'm a do, let's do this, right? I want to do it. I want to reach the world for Jesus. And if you don't, I'll get on to you, but I need something to complain about. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I need something to complain about. I love, that's when I'm thriving, when I'm complaining. I need something to gripe and moan at you about, and you're not doing a good job, and you need to do better. That's when I'm at my happiest. But, but the, the, the ultimate goal of the church is not do. It's really not. See, some would push that the church should be all about engaging social injustice. We've got to make right the wrongs. Everyone start packing guns and, and say, let's go make it better. Some people would say that the church is supposed to be all about caring for the poor. Dig wells. Stop abortion. Get prayer back in schools. Keeping God we trust on our money. These are admirable things. But the gathering of the saints, it's not about these things. That's not why this place is here. And that's not why we gather. See, in the text, you notice here, look back in Luke 19. You'll notice in the text that there were some people that objected when he said, what the church should be all about. When we gather, there's a certain thing that's supposed to happen here, like the main paramount thing. And when Jesus talked about it, there were people that objected to it. Did you notice that there was some uh, religious, uh, I'm sorry, leading priests, uh, teachers of religious law, and other leaders of the people? And I don't know about you, but like when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, Man, these, the, the people in the church, you know, the, the priests and the, the teachers of the law, they're in the church, but it says that there was other leaders of the people. Not necessarily church people, right? Not necessarily the folks in the church, but there were other people that were leaders of the people too in other ways, civic ways, cultural ways, leadership in different ways. And I, I just think that they, they represent even now any outside influence that says this is what the church should be. And I, need, I think we need to just not listen to those things. We just need to listen to Jesus. And I believe that if, if, if it's not about the doing, like all these other organizations would have you to believe, but I do believe the word of God. And the word of God says that he's placed us together in the body perfectly. And as each of us does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. And the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. And so I don't think the focus is to go do these things that everyone should do their own special work. The focus is not to do the work. The focus, it says in the word, is that God equips his people for these works by preaching the word of God to them. When you hear the word of God, these things will happen. So we don't gather to, to pull up resources so we can go do things. We gather so that we can hear the word of God so it inspires us and then we will go do things. Do you see how we've changed the order here? That's what a church is supposed to be. <clears throat> Jesus' actions here in Luke 19... They tell us clearly, I believe, what the main reason is for the saints gathering. It's right there in verse 47. After that, he taught daily in the temple. People need to hear the word of God. 
I've said this a million times from this pulpit. You don't need to hear my fish stories, my dog stories, my vacation stories. It doesn't matter. Let's reserve it for the lobby. But when we walk in this room, it's the word of God. And every single time you walk in here, if I don't say open your Bibles, you ought to leave. Any church that's not doing that is not a church worth going to. People need to hear the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Jesus said, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. This is what we need. So instead of all the other things that people think church should be, Jesus dismantles all that stuff and he refocuses us. We come to church to hear from God. That's why we're here. And we come to church so that God can talk to us. It's a house of prayer, right? Which is simply this, a conversation with God. That's what we do. He talks to us, we talk to him, we spend time with him. That's why we gather in church. That's why at Revolution we stress so much, Psalm 96.1, singing to the Lord, as Zephaniah 3.17, as the Lord sings over you, right? What is that? That's just prayer in music, isn't it? That's what he wants. And what is Jesus doing here? He's talking to them. People need to hear from God. And so that's what he says. That's what I'm going to do. Every day I'm going to show up and God's going to talk to you. That's what he did. And that's why here at Revolution, the word of God is so central to everything that we do. We have to hear the word. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, he could have told him a lot of things. That was his ultimate student. What did he tell him right there? Preach the word. That's what I need you to do. I need you to preach the word of God. I don't need you to do other stuff. I, I don't need you starting this ministry and that ministry and all these different things and social injustice and felt needs and all. That's awesome. Preach the word. Preach the word. And that's what I endeavor to do till my breath is gone every week. Now, I'm certainly not Jesus by any means, but you see, we're just trying to model what Christ does. Christ says when the, when the people gather, they need to hear from God. So what does he do? He preaches every single week. They gather, and what does he do? He, God, the word, speaks the word to the people. That's what he's doing. And certainly I'm not Jesus by any stretch. But listen to this. You know what Martin Luther is? Protestant Reformation? He said this. Tis a right, excellent thing that every honest preacher's mouth is Christ's mouth and his word and forgiveness is Christ's word and forgiveness. For the office is not the preacher's but God's. And the word which he preacheth, see that little King James there, preacheth, is likewise not the preacher's but God's. Uh, John Calvin said this, when a man has climbed up into the pulpit, it is so that God may speak to us by the mouth of a man. And if you don't think I feel the weight of that every single week, you need to wake up to reality. I understand that a wretched thing like me, that the creator of heaven and earth who is perfect in every way would use me to speak to people. I shared with our band uh, earlier in prayer something that I was reminded of today. That Jesus, who can walk on water, chose not to. He asked Peter to use his boat. That, that, that Jesus, who brought down food, manna from heaven, didn't need help with that. He asked the little kid for his lunch. That he wants to use us for his greatest achievements. Awesome, right? Awesome. And so every single time you come to church, if the preacher's preaching the word of God, listen, there's, a, there's a, one of the major confessions in the church over the years says that the preaching of God's word is God's word. That when I'm, when I'm speaking a verse from this Bible, it's as if, and I shudder to say it, but this is true, that's as if Jesus himself was standing here speaking this to you. These are his words, they're not mine. And that's what we do when we come to church. We need to hear the word of God. And Jesus models that perfectly here in the scripture. He knows what the human soul needs. He's the one who made it. He knows what it needs to live and be healthy. And so he preaches 
every single day the word of God to the people. You're not going to believe this, but I'd like the band to come up. I know, it's quicker than normal. But we're going to do things a little bit differently. So let's just say this in closing, our message anyway, this portion of the evening, but it's no, by no means even close to complete. But I would just say this, that the main reason for Jesus gathering his people together isn't to pool resources so we can at attack social injustice. And it's not to pool resources together to feed people or dig wells in drought-laden nations. It's not the reason. Nor is it so we could mindlessly repeat religious rituals that accomplish nothing, week in and week out. It's not this place where the special will benefit. Certain ones, the elite, the, the scholars, the, 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 the leading priests. and It's not a place for personal gain. It's not a business. It's a place where we prepare for heaven. It's a place where heaven and earth meet. Where we get to have a glimpse into what we're going to do for the rest of eternity. That's what this is right here, right now. And I don't know from the looks of the crowd out here, I don't know that if you realize that that's the truth. By your posture, by your, by your eyes. By, I mean, like, think of this. This is the reality that God wants to meet with his people right here. The, the creator of heaven and earth right here, preparing you for heaven. It's, it's the place where God has created so that we could hear from him and where he could hear from us in our worship. It's a place where we can connect with our creator. That's why God provided for this place. And that's why you're here right now. now I don't know why you came tonight, why you think you came tonight, but the reason why God made this place and came tonight was for that, so that he could talk to you through his word, sing over you through his music, to connect with you, to commune with you, to be close to you. That's why you're here. So that being said, I want to practice what we preach, right? We've got to practice what we preach. We don't need more theology. We need more obedience. Someone say amen. amen. Okay. I want to offer this to you. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to step away. And whenever you want to, you can come up and you can take communion. You can take the drink. You can take the cracker. You can go back to your seat. And you can take a few moments and just hang out with the Lord. And just get close and spend time with him. That's why you came here tonight. You came here tonight not just to hear some guy talk, but you really wanted to hear God talk. And so we just want to get, we're just going to get quiet. I just ask you just come up, take the elements, go back to your seat, take them when you are ready to take them after you spend a few moments with the Lord. And, and then here in a few moments, um, Carl and, and Kim will be up here at the front of the stage and if you would like to have someone pray for you pray with you if you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior they're going to show you how it's so simple it's crazy I only knew it was that easy all along dang it <laughs> so, so, so pray with them and then uh, after that's all done uh, the band is going to go into probably a very extended time of worship tonight and they've said they'll stay here till midnight one o'clock in the morning if you want to but if you want to go by no means are you under obligation but we just want to we're going to keep the lights dim and and if you need to go it's cool but if you wanted to stay and hang out with the lord for the next couple hours you can they're just going to play and worship i will say this when communion's over class time for the kids is over so if you do have kids please let's honor and respect our teacher and Go back and get your kids, but you can bring them back in here and they can worship. That's fine. That's cool. All right? So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to open up the communion table. You can come up and receive whenever you want. All right? Father, I thank you um, 
for your presence here tonight. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the church, Lord. I, I, love, I love the local church, Lord. Man, it's, it's been what a crazy ride. My Lord, you got us on a crazy ride, Jesus. But man, there's just no place I'd rather be. I just love it. Even through all the hard times, Lord, it is so beautiful. Our best friends. Where else can you go to find your best friends and the place where they'll stab you in the back? All in one time. It's awesome. But it's a good place, Lord. It's real. And that's what we want. We want a place that is real. An authentic body that loves you, meets with you, passionate for you, enjoys being with you, loving each other, loving you. That's all we want, Lord. So help us with that. Let, let this message tonight, although it's short in length, let it be long in lingering. Help us to be reminded often of your incredible provision for this place so we could come here and do this. It's supernatural, Lord. It was super amazing, Lord. We want to steward this place well. We, like you, want to see this place leveraged for your glory. That thousands would come to know and love you because we were here. Help us with that, Lord. Help us to stay focused on that. In Jesus' name.